Welcome to the Taylor Method for Pain-Free Living, a podcast that features enlightening conversations with experts in the medical field that helps to improve the health and well-being of those suffering from chronic pain due to injury. Learn from leading authorities the questions you should be asking to experience pain-free living. Hosted by father and son, Dr. Derek Taylor and Dr. Hudson Taylor, and joined by industry professionals in the health field, including doctors of integrative medicine and personal injury attorneys. Enjoy well-rounded and informative conversations to help you get out of pain while achieving optimal wellness. Dr. Derek Taylor and Dr. Hudson Taylor are the doctors of Taylor Chiropractic and Laser Center in Florida and California. Both father and son duo have earned respect and a solid reputation for successfully helping people transform their lives by assisting them to discover the hidden causes of their painful health challenges, leading them to experience the resolution of their problems using the Taylor Method. Tune in each week to learn about the Taylor Method, Dr. Taylor's proprietary technology that looks at the whole person and identifies the root cause of pain while facilitating natural healing and helps to restore the body to optimal wellness without using drug injections or surgery. Well, welcome to the show. Our guest today is Dr. Tel Oren from Ecopolitan. He is a doctor of chiropractic. He's a medical doctor. He's board certified in functional medicine and clinical nutrition. He does so much stuff and helped so many people over the years. Dr. T, welcome to the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, Dr. T, there's many things that you do and help people, uh, but we're going to focus this show on what you do so well all across the country. You've been doing it for over 20 years. It's the skin clinics um, where you're doing blemish removal. Tell us a little bit more about how that all got started and, you know, the background of that. Well, many years ago, more like 30, 33 years ago, I started reading up about um different ways to address skin lesions. And since I like to help people in every way possible, I started looking into it and uh, started uh, playing with some materials that um, I could uh, modify and add um, new things to make them more effective. Uh, I've read some old articles about the use of trichloracetate, which is a type of acid and they realized that it was a bit too inflammatory and has some negative effects that uh, needed to be improved upon. So I started playing with it and making it also more antiseptic, you know, less likely to cause any types of uh, side effects or, reac or reactions, uh, such that um, after a few years, I feel like I got a pretty good a product that I could use and that allowed me to be introduced to different types of skin lesions and start learning more about the skin because most doctors, holistic practitioners never deal with the skin. It's more likely that as soon as they see something, they will refer their patients to the dermatologist instead of helping the patient avoid the surgery avoid the long waits in clinics, uh, avoid the risks of biopsy, avoid the risk of um, observing a lesion without doing anything until it's too late. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of healthy, uh, healthy oriented, uh, wellness oriented practitioners are missing an opportunity to help their patients mm. in a way that is a very significant from the patient's perspective, whether it's for cosmetics or it's for risk mitigation. Right. A lot of patients are very concerned about their skin for obvious reasons. It's what you see. And if they have a tumor in their pancreas, they will not see it. Uh, it could be a benign tumor in the uterus. They won't see it. But as soon as something grows on their skin, they pay attention uh, because everybody else can see it and they get comments. Mm -hmm. So from cosmetic perspective it's extremely significant for people because they have so so much uh, self-consciousness about their skin and they look in the mirror and they see a new growth and they start hiding it they put their hair over it whatever wherever it is it, it makes a huge impact on their life and they are extremely thankful when they have a non-surgical 
non-painful, easy, on the spot, no need for anesthetics approach to eliminate those lesions with minimal to no scarring, uh, depending of course on the depths of the lesion, but it's far, far superior to any results they would obtain with surgical treatments. And so as I was now able to start working with the skin, I started learning more and more and researching and figuring out things that are life-saving because the research is usually in this regard, the research is very good. But if it's not research that's applicable clinically, even the dermatologists are ignoring it. For example, I learned uh, maybe 20 years ago that the deepest lesion that appears small and dark, you know, the, the pigmented lesion that people have on their skin very often, the dark ones, not the light brown freckles, but the really dark one um, are very common. But what people don't know is that the smaller they are, the deeper they are. Therefore, the smaller ones are actually uh, of greater medical significance for the future than the large ones. But it's not something that the skin doctors know how to address because they don't know what to do for tiny dark spots. So they simply ignore them until they become really scary looking. And if you really want to avoid the risk of potentially lethal skin cancers, like melanoma, you want to know where those things could start and where they are more risky. So the deeper lesion, the one that grow into your skin as opposed to on the surface or on the outside of it, are the ones that if something happens to them and they mutate, they may, may end up in the blood circulation long before anything will be visible on the surface of the skin. So when you go and have it observed by a skin doctor who's looking at it again and again every six months, as long as it's growing inwards, they will not see anything. And by the time they see something, it will be like a cloud around that original tiny dot. But by that time, it could very well already be in the circulation, which means it's too late. They discovered it, but it was discovered too late. So this type of research that I was reading, I knew immediately how to apply my method to treat those tiny lesions and eliminate the risk altogether by eliminating those tiny dark spots that are always being ignored until it's too late, I don't ignore them. I get rid of them with no surgery, no pain, no scar, just a tiny, tiny white mark remains where a very dark, flat, smooth spot used to be. And that means no more melanocytic cells, no more risk of melanoma. After 30 years and 200,000 patients, between myself and all the doctors that I have trained in my method, physicians around the country and in other countries who are using my method, uh, between all of us, we have never seen a melanoma occurring in a patient that has been treated after we have inspected their body and eliminated those tiny dots that might appear cosmetic to the patient or to the practitioner, but they may have a sinister um, potential to them. And we are just eliminating that potential, which is easy to do when your method is non-surgical and not causing any pain. So those little tiny dark moles, are those actually melanomas or are those potential melanomas? It's a good question. I would not call them either. Because yeah. first of all, what do you, how do you characterize or quantify the word potential? If something can become a melanoma in a rate of one in a thousand, is it enough to call it a potential? That's a matter of opinion. 
Some people will say, if it's only one in a thousand, I wouldn't even call it a potential. But if it's one in 50, I would call it a potential. So it's a statistical kind of a question. Um, all I can say is we are eliminating the risk or drastically reducing the risk by eliminating those tiny spots that are smooth, that are flat. So you cannot fill them with your fingers. You can see them only with your eyes. And where are they so, typically located? Those tiny spots? Are oh, they in, in, in an obvious spot? Or are they hidden in cracks and crevices where people are not? Yeah, they could be anywhere, but the highest risk areas for them are the areas of the body that have not been in the sun. So, for example, in women, it's very common to find these spots on the thighs. Almost 50% of melanomas in women are on the thighs, between the knee and the hip joint, which is a place you wouldn't expect. But if you understand how the sun protects us from melanoma, it might contribute to carcinoma, which is not a very risky cancer. But the sun protects us against melanoma because a short time of exposure every day, especially during noontime, short exposure of your skin to the sun actually helps you correct any mutations in the DNA. So if a cancer has been initiated in your skin, just initiate the very earliest phase, exposure to the sun for up to 20, 25 minutes if you're white skin would actually reverse the formation of the cancer. So the sun protects us from cancer. And people who are not in the sun enough are at much higher rate of melanoma. The risk gets higher the less sun you, get, you have. That's proven scientifically. It's in my book on the topic. A lot of people don't realize that Melanoma has increased by 3,000% in the last 30 years. That's because everybody's staying out of the sun. They're exactly. Listening to, their, listening to their medical doctors who are saying the sun is evil. Exactly. And they work indoors. A lot more people are, are no, no longer farmers, more computer work. You know, people are indoors all the time. And suddenly we have a huge increase. Plus they're using SPF products, all those sun protection products that eliminate the benefit of the sun rays. So they don't get any of that, uh, of those nutrients that the skin manufactures as a result of being exposed to the solar photons. So if you have, let's say we have a listener, a patient who's listening and um, she looks down on her, she's wearing shorts right now. She looks at her upper inner thigh. Lo and behold, there's a dark mole right there. If she starts getting exposure in the sun, can that start reversing that? What should they do if they see something like that? Now, so the sun will protect or reduce the risk of cancer. Yes. Okay? Mutation. But once you have a, an area of deep pigmentation, that's an aggregation of melanocytic cells mm -hmm. that have manufactured their pigment, which has been oozing out of them and permeating the area around them. So the deeper the lesion is, the darker it will appear because you are seeing more of it in one line of, of a vision. So you they see, should be they should be getting rid of that then, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? Yeah, you I mean, uh, if it's very dark and if it's smooth, meaning it grew inwards instead of outwards, if it's smooth to the touch and it's very dark and it doesn't look like a freckle because it's more circumscribed, you can more easily see the delineation um, between the lesion and the skin around it. And if, especially if it's new, the new lesions are more risky. And especially um, if it's very small and also if it's varied in colors, you know, if the, if the pigment is not identically homogenous throughout the lesion, that's an increased risk. But generally, a lot of the innocent looking skin lesions that look like those tiny dark dots, they could look like a, a black marker that you just mark on the skin. It could be dark brown. If you are redheaded or Fitzpatrick type one or one and a half, 
it needs to be graded on a curve because then even if it's not as dark, it's considered dark for you. So you have to compare it with your freckles, compare it with the rest of your body. And if you have five or four of them, then I would recommend to go to uh, see one of the doctors that I have trained or myself when I'm in the area to eliminate just those tiny dots that are considered by many skin doctors just cosmetic molds that should be left alone until it's too late. So basically you put your little solution on that, it drives deep into that mold, getting to the root of it, and then it just falls off. It's no longer yes. dark, it's white. If you yes. got it all, it stays like that. If you didn't get it all, then it may grow back, but then you guarantee your work and it'll you do another right. treatment if need be, correct? Yeah, well, it's point? pretty it's pretty simple um, to see. Uh, immediately during treatment, how deep it is because of how it reacts to the treatment. Ah, uh, so, so, the, so this treatment. is a very, this is a non-surgical, non-medical method yeah. where we just apply a little liquid to the lesion and it doesn't cause pain, just a little mosquito bite kind of a sting, very easy to tolerate, even babies. And it penetrates into the lesion And if I see based on the reaction that I need to do more because it's deeper, then I apply two or three times instead of just once. Right. So maybe four times. And that should be enough to get it all the way to the root. So when it falls off as a scab and the scab will fall off within two weeks, three weeks, depending on how deep it is and how wide it is and the location and other factors. So once it falls off, there should be no melanocytic trace, meaning no pigment at all. But if for any reason, which is pretty rare, only 95% was eliminated, and there's a tiny, tiny tip of the root, of the rootlet remaining, then three months later, four months or six months later, it can easily be eliminated in a follow-up for which there's never any charge. Uh, to clean it up and make sure that it's totally white. And that's it. Um, Once you eliminate all those dark ones, it becomes so much easier to know if you have a new one, because when you take care of the forests, you can easily see when a new tree is growing. And then you eliminate the risk altogether. And, you know, it takes a long time for a dot like that to become a melanoma. A long time, sometimes never. But why take the risk when you know that um, one out of 50 people will develop a melanoma in their lifetime, even less than that, then if you have enough of those dots, get rid of them and you eliminated 99% of your risk of ever developing a melanoma. That's fascinating. So your treatments are both, when you're putting your solution on it, is both therapeutic, doing the work, but it's also diagnostic, letting you know the magnitude of that of that lesion that's that's brilliant and uh fascinating now that's what melanoma those are the most dangerous obviously one of our good family friends there was a a beautiful young gal she was in her early 20s she had the dark spots just like you're saying ignored it and that eventually like you said got in the circulation she did metastasize into her bone and lung she died very shortly after that so this is life-saving work that you're doing now yeah it's life-saving but it's not heroic because yeah. we're only removing little dots. But... Right, no, but most people, are they're not even aware of that. That's why I love what you do. Now, there's other things that you hear people say, oh, uh, they have these big procedures done. They, done. they do the most procedures saying they're going down deep into it. And with uh, basal cell carcinomas, that's not as dangerous, correct? Can you talk a little bit about that, treating your yeah. basal cell yeah. carcinoma? So BCCs or basal cell carcinomas are, are never going to kill anyone they can invade a little bit into adjacent tissue and make people uh, have a deformation or, um, you know, aesthetically unpleasing situation resulting from BCC, but it it never kills anyone. So it's not a major uh, worrisome cancer. It's not a real cancer in a way because it never metastasizes. Uh, but BCC should still be eliminated because if it invades adjacent tissue, it's harder to get rid of, and it does lead to a much more involved surgery that could be, well, highly 
an anesthetic uh, with the end results. So if we remove these, which are very easy to remove because they're pretty superficial mm -hmm. um, most of the time. Now, a lot of people come to us uh, when they already had a surgery for a BCC, but it came back because the recurrence is very high, especially after um, most procedures that are done in the plastic surgeon's office. See, the dermatologists usually don't do anything about it. They just, unless they freeze it with liquid nitrogen, which often leaves their roots intact. So they don't really address the roots and it often comes back or they try to shave it. A lot of time it will come back because they didn't get all the roots or they do a biopsy where they use um, a sharp instrument to spoon it out or shave it. And by doing that, some of the cells are dragged deeper into the skin and then they get missed. So all of these things could lead to recurrence. But when you do a Mohs procedure, which is really excessive, a Mohs procedure goes much, much deeper than the skin lesion is, so it's not necessary to go that deep. And it keeps chopping right through it, pushing more potentially cancerous cells deeper into the tissue, which increases the rate of recurrence. And if they do a biopsy, they show you what was in the skin, not what's remaining in it. What's remaining, what stayed behind is now more inflamed because of the biopsy. So the inflammation itself increases the risk of a new carcinoma forming on the same area or adjacent to it, uh, even as a result. Plus the most procedure goes too deep, creates very deep scar tissue and scar tissue by itself is inflamed tissue that doesn't allow enough circulation and lymphatic drainage. So the skin becomes very unhealthy in those areas mm -hmm. and the risk of re reforming cancer in that area is much higher once the skin has learned the trick mm -hmm. of becoming cancerous. Mm -hmm. So all of these things have to do with BCC. But with SCC, squamous cell carcinoma, which is also very easy to eliminate in the earlier stages because it's so superficial. But if you biopsy that, you can actually spread it. Mm -hmm. And squamous cell carcinoma can metastasize and can kill people. And I've seen a lot of people who have come to see one of the doctors that I've trained uh, with the pride of having the diagnostic report from the, from the pathologist showing them that they had SCC, squamous cell carcinoma, and they removed it on the skin itself, but it was already spread by the biopsy, and three years later, or four years, or two and a half years, depending on their immune system, they suddenly had metastasis and they died. Mm -hmm. So the biopsy itself can be the cause of metastasis with cancers that can metastasize like squamous cell carcinoma or melanoma. So even melanoma, when it is superficial, when it is the kind that grows sideways on the surface of the skin and can easily be visible, and these constitute 10% of the melanomas. These are the ones where the skin doctors are the heroes, where they catch them uh, as soon as they see the change, because they change on the surface of the skin, it's easy to see. Mm -hmm. But those are superficial spreading. They are not very um, dangerous. They're not lethal because they are on the surface and they are visible before they get into the circulation. They can easily be removed without risk. But when they do a biopsy, they can introduce those less dangerous melanomas into this into the circulation mm. and now they become more risky that's 10 percent the other 90 percent are the ones that occur with people who regularly go to an inspection at the dermatologist office once a year twice a year and they think that they're safe because of that but the 90 percent are the ones we talked about earlier the ones that are ignored while they grow deeper and deeper 
until they suddenly show up around the original dots. And those are the ones that kill people, that are really dangerous, that lead to chemotherapy, to systemic problems. Those are 90%. So only 10% are caught by the dermatologist early enough before they are dangerous, and then they biopsy them, which increases the risk of spread. Mm. Whereas with our method, we don't have that problem because we never cause a spread. The lesion becomes coagulated, it dies. It becomes a scab. So everything that was in it, including the material that was applied to it, the whole thing falls off. It never becomes a part of the person's body. Mm. And there's never a risk of cutting um, that would lead to uh, any cells uh, dragging or tracking, as we say medically. Uh, needle tracking is a well-known phenomena where you stick a needle into a tumor, and as you pull the needle out, the cells of the tumor are attached to the outside of the needle, and as it's dragging out, those cells are tracking be beyond that, behind that needle, and are left in the tissue in other locations that it, uh, were not supposed to be, including the circulation and so forth. So that's why when people get biopsied for prostate cancer, uh, when they pull the needle out and they put it in through the rectal mucosa, then they often see metastasis of the prostate cancer in the, in the rectum mm. because of needle tracking. So wow. this also happens when you do biopsy on the skin. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so much better to catch things early yeah. before they become famous. What, what is a famous skin lesion? For, you know, what you heard is the A, B, C, D, E. Asymmetry, border, color, diameter, evolution. Those are the five big things that are, we are taught to watch out for. A, B, C, D, E of melanoma, but those only are noticeable at the late phase when yeah. it's very, very advanced. What we are doing is we are not engaging in prevention the medical way. Mm -hmm. We eliminate the risk so we never even need to look for the A, B, C, D, E. We prevent, we prevent the prevention, if you know what I mean. Right. Pre preventive medicine today is not really preventative it's only a slightly earlier detection when it's often too late. Early intervention is the key. Well, this has been a fascinating show, Doc. We have to wrap up our time. There's, I, I feel like I could be on this call here with you for hours. Sorry, Dr. Hudson, I didn't give you a chance to talk. I'm just- No, no, it was fa <laughs> absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah. but you should, be aware, you should be aware that uh, most of people who come to benefit from my method are coming for cosmetic reasons because right. they want to get okay. rid of all it those unsightly. So, it, it goes so far deeper than that because it's going to physiological, functional, and life-saving yes. measures. I mean, there's so many more questions I want to talk to you, like about moles and pigmentation and how that comes from neurological irritation or yes. the skin tags that you treat in your clinics that comes usually from hormone imbalance or the moles that are congenital or from birth and considered birthmarks and how cancer often starts within them. There's some in keratosis, those hard scaly protrusions yes. that people that you treat. Anyway, I think if they, there's so much more and we, we don't have time for a four hour show, we're going to have to cut it off now. <laughs> but if they have, they want more information, how can they get that? How can they get in contact with you? How can they come to one of these skin clinics? Can you uh, share? Um, well, that? you know, there are clinics around the country um, conducted by many physicians that I have trained, you know, in different, from the West Coast to the East Coast. I guess if people want to know who their own uh, coordinator is, they can go to uh, ecopolitan.com. Okay. Um, uh, or they can just email clinic at ecopolitan.com. Uh, okay. Then they can be referred to the coordinators in their area. Clinic at ecopolitan that's e c o p o l i t a n clinic at ecopolitan.com in the near future we will start opening um, a network of anti-aging health and beauty clinics called the rambo 
method and that would include also the skin and then it will be easier because the website will have the word Rambo in it. <laughs> People will easily Everybody be able knows to that. spell that. Yes. <laughs> but that's well, not there, not ready yet. But for now, it's the clinic at ecopolitan.com. Right. Well, thank Excellent. you for joining us on the show. It's been fascinating. And uh, uh, thank you. you. You've been listening to the Taylor Method for Pain Free Living. Our guest today was Dr. T. Oren. Uh, of Ecopolitan, <laughs> Dr. Adiel Tell Orn. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, we just call him Dr. T for short. Uh, Ecopolitan, uh, the eco health community, it's been a fascinating show. You're, this is cutting edge. This is really innovative and life saving for so many people. Doc, thank you thank so you. much for sharing your wisdom. Thank you. Thanks for having Dr. me. I appreciate your uh, opportunity to, uh, to educate the public. That's great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for listening to the Taylor Method for Pain-Free Living podcast. For more information about the Taylor Method and how you can find lasting pain relief, visit www.drderektaylor.com. That's www.drderektaylor.com.